two overdrive continues brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hazio, Doug Jeff O'Neill, Jamie Noodles, McLennan. We got role play level of concern in about a half an hour. So whenever that is on the docket, you can bank on hearing from Nicholas Cage, Marty Wildwood, right, or Rick Bushwood, whatever you choose to to use uh, as a moniker for our boy. And uh yeah, we'll play the roles of many different people in many different scenarios. That's coming up in half an hour. Brian Burke will join us. And uh, Brian's played the role of GM, president of hockey operations. He's been around the game for a long time, though, and I don't have to sit here and explain what he's all about and what he's accomplished. But he worked with Brad Tree Living in Calgary. Didn't Perfect guy to him? have on today. He yeah, I believe he hired him. hired him. Yeah, yeah he, he hired him, him to be the GM. That's right. So he went through this process. He played the role of Shanahan before Shanahan. And Trey Living comes in. Um, he's been at the front of the line really since the start of the process. You know, it, it feels as if this isn't breaking news. It's just confirmed news, right? Like Trey Living has been interviewed. He's been in town. Uh, his name has been linked to the job. It feels like almost since day one. And now it's official. And is it groundbreaking? Is it out of left field? No. But is is he a good GM that's had success in the league? Absolutely. Is he has he won the ultimate prize? No. So Shanahan and Tree Living can't come out tomorrow and say, I'm gonna do what I did here. Like I don't think he can reference Calgary as an example of what he's gonna bring here because Calgary didn't win cups, right? So right. he's gotta adapt. He's gotta change. Um but I, I think he's a smart guy. I think it's a good, consistent hire for an organization that has been run well for a long time, right? Like this idea that they're in turmoil and that it's a mess and, you know, the, the rats are running wild. That's not been the case, and it's not true. The rats and, are running wild. And I think Tree Living's going to step in wow. and, and jump on a, a moving bus that, yes, has not won anything in the playoffs, needs change, but has been well run and has been a respectable organization for a while. And you know, he should be time. hungry. Like, he's got to be hungry, too. But this is an opportunity for him. You know, here, it's a new piece for him. Hey, like, you always say this. That people can cement their le- legacies in, right. in, you know, this city if they have success. If they, you know, people, Kyle Dubas was on his way. A lot of people like him, including us. You know, he, he was on his way to cementing his legacy here, and, and he pivoted. They, they pivoted away from him. But, mm-hmm. you know, here's a scenario for Brad Tree Living to come in. And continued, you know, it's like you said, an organization that has depth as far as the front office. It's It's got a lot of good pieces in place, and he needs to continue that on and put his yeah. stamp on this team. Sure. That's what he needs to do. And, yes, he's worked in a Canadian market, but as you know, Noodles, living in both places, Toronto's right. a different beast than Calgary. A hundred percent. It's the a size of the market, beast. the passion. You know, Toronto and, and Brian Burke can speak to it, too, is – you know, Cal- Toronto is such a big animal. Calgary, you know, it, it's been more of a oil and gas, white collar city. Mm-hmm. A lot of transient people come from other cities that move to Calgary. That's what I experienced uh, right. when I first moved there. You know, I've had a couple tours of duty in Calgary and grew up, obviously, in Alberta. But, you know, Brian Burke can speak to both markets and how passionate they are. Sure. Um, just the size is different. Well, let's bring him in here. He's the uh, former GM of the Leafs and former president of hockey operations out there in Calgary, joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline, back on Overdrive. Here's Brian Burke. Uh, thanks for doing this, Brian. We appreciate it. And obviously, uh, you know, you're aware of this. It's coming up a lot with Tree Living coming aboard. You know, he learned in Calgary, and he can apply it to Toronto. You, you know it better than anyone. You worked in both spots. How would you compare and contrast the two markets? Well, I loved working and living in Calgary. Like Noodle said, it's a, it's a great place to live. People are wonderful. It was my favorite place to work in the NHL. Uh, and it's a passionate hockey market. They're knowledgeable. They love the game. They're, they're uh, die-to-the-wool um, Flames fans. Difference is scale, like Noodle just said. The, you're talking on a, on a typical day on a Tuesday, if we didn't play a game, we would have maybe 20 reporters cover the, you know, three cameras and 15 beat and, and column guys doing stories. So it'd be a small group, a couple of cameras. Uh, Toronto on a non-game day, it's 80 and seven cameras. So, and on a game, like Hockey Night in Canada game on a Saturday night, it's over 100. And that's why, I don't think people realize, that's why dressing rooms are that big. They're for the media. Like, we don't need half that room in these buildings. And then on a typical day where you practice or play, 
you don't need any space. You'd really rather the the benches were closer together so guys could make eye contact and speak. My favorite rink in, in Europe is in, in uh, Cologne, or at the practice rink. Their practice rink is on rollers. So they practice and they make eye contact like we all did as kids. You're looking 10 feet away at a guy across from you, taping your, your shin pads and talking about the game. And then after the game, they move the rollers back about 15 feet so there's room for the media. But that's the difference would be the scale. Berkey, with Tree coming in, what do you think is imperative for a general manager coming into a new scene? Is it like a statement, a PR move, or just what he does with the hockey team as far as what his vision is and putting that into play as far as player personnel? Well, it's a little bit of both, though. I, I think you know you got there is a PR side to this, and uh, some people are better at it than I was, obviously. But I think if you can do something – you know, sign an unrestricted free agent and get some popularity points that way. One of the guys is well liked. There's probably something you could do quickly to curry some favor that's in your best interest, not to do it just for the PR, but mm-hmm. fine. But generate some good PR out of it at the same time. It's probably a, a cheap, easy way to start. But then you've got major decisions, and I think you have to prioritize them, but I think they're pretty simple to prioritize. In which way? Like what? What uh, if you're looking at this gotta, job? The, the what Austin are the Matthews right away. Austin yep. Matthews, the coach. The coach can wait. Sheldon Keith's a good coach. He's done a good job. Maybe he comes back. Maybe he doesn't. But you can certainly say to them, "I, I got to wait, Sheldon. You got to wait till after the draft. I got a lot of other stuff to do. Figure out Austin Matthews. Figure out Nylander going on a no trade. Figure out or a limited no trade. Figure all that out. You got to wait a little bit, but." It's an unfortunate part of the business, but he would have to be a viable candidate to survive this anyway. Right. Well, and, and you, you know, you talk about messaging and, and PR. Uh, I'm curious, you know, where you stand on that in this market. When I, I consider, you know, the way you approached it, you were always accessible. You were, you were always doing media, TV, radio, you know, newspaper, whatever it was. And, and with Dubas, with Kyle, by the end of his run, he didn't do any of that. He really was never made available. I don't know if that was his choice or the team's choice. Uh, if if Trey Living called you up and, and asked for your advice on how he should go about, you know, being available, messaging, you know, what kind of advice would you give to him? Well, I would disagree a, a lot about what you just said, Kevin, in terms of my accessibility, because I'm really happy to hear you say that, that people think I was accessible. I actually cut back my access dramatically uh, after my first few weeks there and let the coach talk. So to me, the problem with Toronto is if the GM's talking all the time, the coach is talking all the time, people are confused. The players even are looking at, well, who are we listening to here? Listen to the coach or listen to the GM? So I cut way back. I think you're right. Early on I did. And I, on major stuff, I was always successful. That's, I think, a big difference in Toronto. There's a big trade, or someone gets sent down, or some major happens. Um, that's where you have to be accessible, and that's where I think I would step in in a, in a crisis and deal with whatever it needed to be dealt with. But I wanted the coach to speak for the team more than me and the players. Berkey, we've been talking about it a lot, and you've been in a lot of different organizations now throughout your career, um, and you've been afforded a lot of different resources. So. You know, one thing that was pointed out is, you know, Tree Living comes to, you know, Toronto MLSE. It's a big corporation. Do you feel like the more resources you have, the better it is for a manager? Or sometimes it might, might be overkill. You know, Calgary's different than you've been in Pittsburgh. You've been in Toronto. You've been in Anaheim, Vancouver. You know, every organization is built differently. But it seems like Toronto just has so many people in that front office. Is that an advantage or sometimes a disadvantage where you've got a lot of people that are pulling on you? I never wanted the biggest staff. I just wanted the best staff. There's a huge difference. And in my mind, you can overkill, hire too many analytics people, hire three or seven goaltending and consultants, and you can staff up and say, look at the staff we have, look at the expertise we've added. The fact of the matter is, at the end of the day, when we get to make a trade, I'm going to turn to two guys in that room, the assistant Jim and the chief scout, and say, what do you guys think? So in my mind, I remember my first board meeting with teachers when I came. I remember one of the board members uh, said to me at the end, what else do you need? And I'd never had anyone ask me that in an owner's meeting before. 
said, what else do you need? I said, what do you mean? I, I thought he was talking about me. Do I need help getting the house or, you know, what, what do I need? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, what else do you need? What else can we spend money on? And I burst out laughing. I said, I've never had an owner ask me that before. But that was the mentality. And, yes, it's nice you can address, like the Marleys. They travel with two buses. All right? Let's get this, though. You, you know what it's like, right? The noodles. You guys played way back when briefly in the minors, if I'm not yeah. mistaken. Two one buses. game. One game, Brian. I was longer, two, though, Berkey. <laughs> two, bu- two buses. So guess what? You have a little more room. It's nice. You have two buses. You think anyone else in pro hockey has two buses? No. So, yeah, it's a nice luxury. I would have said there's no way we're doing two buses. Those guys can get in bed, get into the bus with each other and sit next to people like they're supposed to and get to know your teammates and enjoy it. So I think it's too much. Can you add too many people? Can it get too loud and too many decision makers in the room? Absolutely. And I was very cognizant of that. But I think it's a nice thing if you think, well, would be nice if we had Joe Smith. You can add Joe Smith, and no one says, "Where's the budget on that? Where's the approval on that?" With Brian Burke. So, how how do you think you you marry like the idea of making sure these players feel like you know they're comfortable, that they're treated well, that they have all the resources, but also make sure it's not like a coddling environment? Is that possibly what happens around the Leafs at times? Uh, when I was in Anaheim, just to give you a, a convoluted answer, when I was in Anaheim, I think one player had a car deal, maybe two. Probably Tamu and Scotty Niedermeyer had a deal where they got a car from the dealership and they had to do a couple of appearances. In Toronto, every player's got a car deal, every single one. So I can tell you in Anaheim, Francois Beauchemin, who was a marvelous player for me, he never had a car deal. So it's all of a sudden, you get coddled. Like, you want to buy a stereo, you work for the Leafs, they got a stereo guy. They got a guy who will come and set up the stereo and give you a 30% discount. They got a suit guy. They, they got a furniture guy. So they have a guy. You get coddled <laughs> from the day you get there. You, you I don't know if that's coddling, there. Berkey. I think that's just, that's just hey, I mean, I'm a broadcaster now, but if somebody says, hey, I got a furniture guy, he's going to give you a free couch. I'm taking a free couch. <laughs> yeah, and my, my point is not, uh, you take whatever you want. Oh, my point is, this is expected and handed to you in, in Toronto where it's not a lot of other places. It's just not. It's a different scale. It's a different, and it's not all bad, like you say, oh, but it's not all good either. If, if everyone, guy loses 10 games in a row and he's still got a free Porsche, and he's saying, what the hell, I'd like to get rid of this guy. Yeah, so Kevin, to me, there's a, there's a balance. Yeah, Kevin never got that in Sarnia, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Don't start with me. Uh, with Brian Burke. So in terms of Shanahan's role in this, because you played the role of Shanahan before he did when it comes to Trey Living, Brian, because you hired, you know, Trey Living back in your Calgary days. And, you know, there's a lot of rumors, reports about what Shanahan wants, what, what he wants to do with the players, what he wants to do with the coach. Who knows if it's vetted and it's true or not. But if you're Trey Living or, or put yourself in those shoes, if you go into an interview with Shanahan and you have an understanding of what you think he wants, do you pitch him on that? Do you counter him? Like, how do you go about that process knowing that Shanahan is still at the top? And, you know, if he's going to get what he wants, he's going to get what he wants. Well, understand how, how that has to work in my view. is I remember when I got hired by the Calgary Flames, I said to Ken King, the late, great Ken King, how's this supposed to work? Who's in charge? Am I in charge or is Tree? And he said, just imagine your business partners. He said, you're not going to walk in one day and tell your business partner, I'm trading so-and-so, or I'm taking a month off, or I just made a, I just sold a warehouse. You're never going to do that. You're going to run it by your partner and get consent or some type of consensus. And then at the end of the day, the odd time you have to pull the trigger because you told him gently, I don't think this is a good idea, and you have to put, you have to put your foot down at the end of it. That That's a disaster if it comes to that. You've got to – you got to – finesse that so it doesn't happen. It doesn't come down to where you're saying, no, I'm not approving this. Now, did I put my foot down just a couple times and usually gently, usually let Tree have his way, but you get the message after four meetings where I said, I really think this is dumb, he would drop it. <laughs> right. I think that's, that's how you do it without a showdown. And Shani's got to have the last say. The, the president of the hockey operations has to have final say. And you're going to come to that day someday where they, they, he says no, but that's a disaster. Once that happens, it's like a government failing, right? 
Yeah, that's. A, uh, I wanted to ask you about, you know, the strengths of tree. You just mentioned the working relationship. Uh, you know, what can we expect for him coming to this market? And, you know, we all know he's affable, he's good in the media, but, you know, what would you say maybe one or two things that were are strengths of him as a manager? Well, I think you got to go back to watching him as a player. When I met him, he was playing in the East Coast, or playing in the Western Hockey League. And we played our preseason game, and he fought Gino Ojic. Now, you say to yourself, how'd that go? It didn't go very well, but he fought him because he was trying to make his mark in training camp. Now, that's the guy. He had good pims everywhere he played. He was a, a well-traveled guy in the Western League and played in the coast. This is a guy who had to work for everything he had. This guy comes from a ton of dough, the Boston Pizza family, right? Mm -hmm. But he yeah. never acted like he came from a lot of dough, and they never treated like he came from a lot of dough. He was raised the right way. He was raised to earn what you had, be polite, listen, say thank you, and play hard and do everything you everything you do, do hard. Started working in management when he worked in Columbus, selling tickets. Working in the offseason, selling tickets. How many guys do that? So he's worked at everything he's done. He worked at that new league they put together years ago. Worked in the, uh, when he went to Phoenix. Um, he ran the league. They were in bankruptcy proceedings, so they had to go to Bill Daly for everything. He's just an impressive guy. So I think he's got budgeting strengths. I think he's got a clear picture of how to build a winning team. He's a good guy. Like you mentioned, that goes a long way. He can get people to trust him and listen to him. I think it's a great hire. I really do. We're chatting with Brian Burke. Uh, you mentioned a few moments ago, you know, top of the priority list is, is Matthews. Um, and his, you know, he's not a free agent this year, but he will be a year from July one and he can officially sign an extension as of July one. I'm curious how, you know, he gets to the player or if even that is a possibility, Brian, like does he just deal with the agent or is the new GM, can he not call up Austin directly and, and chat with him about where he stands and like, how does that process possibly work out here? Well, the first trip I made in Anaheim, was the day that Scott Niedermeyer became a free agent, I flew to Cranbrook. And I flew to Vancouver and then took that small dash aid up to um, Canadian Air back then, I think, mm -hmm. to Cranbrook and met with Scott Niedermeyer and said, Scott, what what do you need? What, what are you looking for here? And he said, I want to play with my brother. I want to play in the Western Conference. I'm sick of the Eastern Conference, and I want a chance to win. I said, well, there's only one guy that you should have talked to you that can check all those boxes because I'm the only guy that can keep Robbie Niedermeyer here. And so I said, you, you got you got to deal with me. If that's if that's your list, you got to deal with me. So if I were Tree, and I bet you he's already figured out, he's on a plane in the next day or so, get through your media stuff in Toronto. It's a big burden the first couple of days. Everyone wants an interview. Get through that and then get on an airplane and go sit down with Austin Matthews. Don't talk shop. Just talk hockey, personality, family. Talk about everything but business. And then go and meet with the agent. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean that that's such a big part of the process obviously and and you know how do you see Matthews approaching this Brian based on you know the negotiation in the past how much he's already making you know is is there is there middle ground here where he's he's going to get a raise he's going to get a lot of money but where the Leafs can possibly get a win out of this too I have no idea like you're asking me I don't know Austin Matthews hardly a college said hi to him a couple times I have no idea what, what makes him tick or what he wants after this. Um, I know he has said, at least in the media, he has said he'd like to stay. So that's a good starting point. I know he loves playing here in terms of how he's treated and the, the reverence that the fans have for him in Toronto. I think that's a good starting point. Sit down with him and say, all right, if you want to stay, then we got to talk about an extension. What would it take? And see if there's middle ground there. Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, that's – going to be a yeah. big part of the next month and a half. Um, what about leading up to the draft? You know, they don't have a lot of picks. Um, you know, how important is it to be on the same page with, with your scouting department? Does he have enough time to living to bring in his own people? You know, or is it just such a quick turnaround where he's going to have to let the dust settle, you know, into the summer and maybe bring people in he wants to bring in? You can – when I used to run the draft with Toronto, Vancouver, or whatever, I would call a GM I trusted – so we would have our list, our scouts. I loved our scouts. I trust them completely. But I'd always say, I'll tell you my top five. You tell me your top five in no order. Go uh, alphabetical. I'm not going to tell you who's my number one guy, but I'll tell you my top five are to get some sense that I had the list right. 
at least one of the GMs shared my view on the list. The list we were talking about was right. Tree's got contacts with enough guys. He can do that. They've got great scouts in Toronto. They'll be able to help him without that. But if he wants to double-check things, it's easy to do. I always did it. Well, yeah. we're still going into the uh, cup final here. We got, you know, we got to wait until Saturday night, Brian, but you got Florida, you got Vegas. One team's going to win the first cup, you know, in their franchise's history. How do you see this one playing out? Who do you like going into a cup final? Well, I, I think the this I'm going to give you a lawyer's answer, which is really means I'm going to wimp out and qualify <laughs> everything. I would take Vegas. I think they're the better team. I think they're a deeper team. I think they're uh, more weapons. Um, and I think they've had a better year. They're playing on eighth seed that barely got in. If we had crapped the bed in Pittsburgh, they probably wouldn't have got in. So it's it's uh, to me now. What's so you got? Here's the two factors that change that equation. Where you'd say, okay, I'm taking Vegas. Well, Bobrovsky's been the best goalie on the planet for about four weeks, five weeks. Best goalie on the planet. Best goalie in the last couple of years, probably. So that changes the equation a little bit. Hey, not so fast, Bob. And then. Patrick Kachuk is single-handedly laying armies to waste by himself. Like, this guy's a one-man wrecking crew. So you got to temper their abilities. They, they, they're they dominated more by a handful of players than Vegas is, but uh, they got a warrior factor going and some belief going right now, so it's going to be tough. But if I had to pick, gun to my head, Vegas. Yeah, well, yeah. we'll find out starting uh, Saturday night. Uh, we always appreciate you finding time for us, Brian. We we appreciate it, and we'll do it again down the road. Thank you for this. Okay. Thanks, guys. See there you all. See you, Newell. Yeah, There's Brian. You. <laughs> Brian Burke. <laughs> That might be the last time we have Berkey on. Well, no. I, I, mean, just, that was, be I think that's said. probably the last time. Yeah, you can't just say goodbye <laughs> to two guys on the way out. <laughs> you can't. Like, you can't do it. I'm it's sure he won't lose sleep over it, but. That's probably it. Well, so, I said it, it just. And I was I, carrying the whole thing. You two idiots just sitting there, I, I bringing nothing like, to the table. I felt like the guy what are you talking about. Well, we were asking questions. It's just I needed to take a pause because the other guy decides to throw the word Kevin in there back right. to Berkey, and I'm like, you don't. Now it's like, I, I I'm glad that they put Berkey up on the screen or the yes. you know because I was laughing very hard. But uh, I mean, of course, everyone it, is. I listen, get it. yeah, but no, but it's not. Kevin Hayes is a hockey player. Like it's not like it's you know random. It's 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 just it's it's what is it? it Freudian happens. slip. It's, it's a Freudian slip. That's what it's it all is. Good. So all right, role play deal. level of concern coming up. Overdrive continues. TSN ten fifty and on TSN two. You can never, never. Ask me to stop drinking. Do you understand? I do. I really do. All right, here we go. Role play level of concern. We haven't played this in a while. We know the way it right. works, right? We're all assigned a, a person or a thing or a scenario. We go around the table and we place a level of concern on it. Pine on the patio, no concern, all the way up to Nick Cage. And everything in between. Very simple stuff. All right? Let's get rocking here. Oh, you're playing Leaf fans that want massive change. Oh. What is your level of concern that the coach and the core four are coming back? Um, so that is the, the, the main concern, that, that yes. everything's going to be the same. Yep. You're playing Leaf fans that are dying for change. Core four has got to be broken up. Keith's got to go. Change the whole complexion of the team. I'm not concerned about this because if I'm a Leaf fan, I think that there's going to be proper changes. I don't know if it's like a six-pack, maybe only a couple of beers, because I think anybody that's been watching this has different ideas and views on how things should be done, and there would have to be changes, Hayes. So if I'm that fan wanting change, I would almost think it would have to happen. Yeah. I, then why, I like, if it doesn't happen, why is there a new general manager? That, you well, talked we'll about that out. off the top of the wow. show. Yeah. There's no how could Shanahan, you have Shanahan's running it and wants that and yeah but I you know I I don't know if there was a disconnect between Dubas and Shanahan that'll never come out maybe years from now but it just I feel like there will be change even even Dubas in his year end that Monday said like everything's on the table to me that intimated that you know I I'll look at every different type of deal that comes through so I, think I Shanahan liked that. In retrospect, he didn't want him to speak. 
And I don't think he liked much about it. <laughs> I don't think he liked he about anything either. about that that conversation because he actually said I asked him not to speak because we wanted to get the deal done and things sorted out. And then he said everything's on the table. I'm not sure if basic. I'm paraphrasing. I'm not sure if my head is in this. Uh, concerned about my family, all of that type of stuff. Like that was the the crux of that conversation or that year end presser for Kyle Dubas, where there was so much to pull out of that. Yeah. Like, well, you know, exactly. it was the beginning of the end. It the really end. was. It and was the beginning of, of what's been kind of a wild few weeks. Um, all right, Noodles, you're playing Gary Bettman, Commissioner Gary Bettman. What is yeah. your level of concern that the long delay and these non traditional markets will be a buzzkill come cup final time? Uh, I'm Marty Wildwood. Six Bush Light, six Bud Light, and I love them, tall boys. Two things. The non-traditional market, I get it. You know, one-offs, it's exciting. And, you know, for those markets, so you, you, you talk about the parity in the league. The long layoff, like, let's get going here. You know, basketball's right back at it. Like, to me, I just, I feel like, you know, now you're waiting till Saturday. It's going to stretch. If I think the last day, if it goes to the cup, like, if it goes to game seven, it's like, isn't it June 17th that I read? Yeah. Like, it's something. Oh, yeah. You know, like, that's a long time. Like, I would, I would like to see them go right at it. Again, I know you've got to give Vegas a little bit of time because they got it done in game six, but it's too much. I don't know. How it's too much. Chest, too much. Like, why aren't they playing? You would think about weekend kind of viewer. Get them going Friday and Sunday. Yeah. Why yeah. is that not happening? Get them going immediately. Like now Thursday, the Saturday. Are. I don't know. Yeah. There's no yeah. reason they can't play tomorrow. Monday, game seven was on, on Monday. Yeah. You're telling me Vegas can't. Go back at it Thursday night at home. No but they've less. always kind of been like that, where it's like there's got to be a certain time slot where it starts. Forget yeah, that, man. I, yeah. How many stopping chats and excitement have you heard from people nothing. just walking? There is nothing. Nobody saying. I, I get the random comment. Follow. This is all I get. Nobody. Who do you like? And it's like, yeah. ah, maybe Florida. And that's it. Yeah. yeah. That is it. I agree. So that is Marty it. Wildwood, maybe I should have gotten Nick Cage, but I, I think Wildwood, there is the league probably is happy that. You know, Vegas and Florida, the non-traditional, especially Florida, with attendance and some of the struggles they've gone through. Oh, it's a big prop up for them. Yeah, it is a big prop up. You're right. For sure. But it it also, you know, you're talking the media is driven in in Canada and the Northeast. Right. That's really what, and and you're talking South Florida and Vegas. So it'll still be covered appropriately. It's a cup final. Like everyone's going to be invested in that. But it's, it's. You know, it's different. It is It is certainly different. All right, I'm playing the role of Vladdy Jr. Um, what is my level of concern that my home run prowess was a one-year wonder? That one year where we know he hit all those home runs. Last year he had 32. This year he's got eight. He has still not hit a home run at the Rogers Center. Wow. That is wild. That's like, crazy. Pardon me? He has not hit a home run at home. And, like, FanDuel has a prop Shoot, that you can play. That. Yeah. Exactly. He's on pace for, I believe, under 30 home runs on the season. Still a, a good, you know, power hitter, but not great. Not, not anywhere close to elite. And you can you can play when he's going to hit a home run at, at the Rogers Center on FanDuel. It's playing plus 300 tonight, plus 700 when they play Houston. Like, you can go all the way into June and get, like, plus 4,400 for a game against the A's. In June. Like, it's wild. Like, it just keeps wow. going and going and going. There it is up on TSN, too. And I, I don't even know where you'd sprinkle money because, like, it wouldn't be shocking at all if he hit a home run tonight. I was just going to say, like, how about tonight? Yeah, ex- of course. I think that's probably the, the safe money, right? I think right. Peter DeBoer will like hearing that. But but <laughs> my, my level of concern is, I'll say Marty Wildwood. Six Bush Light, six Bud Light, and I love them, wow. tall boys. Because that big season, like, everything was going out. But as a lot of people pointed out during that season, there were a lot of home runs in Buffalo that year. There were yeah. some home runs in Dunedin. You know, I, I don't think the way he hits the ball, the way he approaches the ball, you know, his swing, he's going to be a great hitter for a long time. But 40-plus, like, elite home run hitter, I don't think that's who he is. How old is he, 24? Yeah, he's in his mid-20s. You know, when is it, when is the cutoff date for him to establish himself as an elite kind of long ball hitter? I think it's still probably a couple of years because we've seen it do him once, right? Like he did it the one time. He had a, he had an unbelievable forty six home runs last yeah, year, right. thirty two. That's not something yeah. to sleep on. No, but I scored forty one goals one time. That doesn't make me a forty goal scorer. Right? Exactly. And it's it 
is trending towards more like 25 to 30 a year, 35. And, and that's a different category. It just puts you in a different spot. Too. Financially, too. Financially, too. Financially, it, it definitely can money, be. right? Yep, it definitely can be. All right. Oh, you're playing the role of live golf haters. Haters. What is your level of concern that they'll be allowed to play in the Ryder Cup? My level of concern that they'll be allowed to play in the Ryder Cup. Mm-hmm. Play it. You can never, never ask me to stop drinking. I played that because I think the shines come off the hatred and the vitriol and all that stuff. And I, I, I just think it's gotten to a point where it's like they're doing their thing. We're doing ours. Everyone wants to put on the best Ryder Cup and the best majors possible. So if they can qualify, that's going to be the difficult thing to how, how you're going to establish how they qualify for these events. Because if guys are grinding it out on the regular tour, how, how are those other guys going to qualify for a Ryder Cup unless the captain of the team just says, that guy's a stud, he's on it. Mm-hmm. You right. know? But I think the kind of, like when John Rahm comes out and just says, let, let, let them play. Right. Like it's just, yeah. it's getting to a point where they're all going to say that because when you're associated with the Ryder Cup, everyone wants it to be the best event. Well, that hasn't come up enough. That it's all about politics and all that. The guys who are on the team, they want to win. No right? kidding. And, and that USA team that went to Wisconsin, I what yeah, was Yeah, Whistling the name Straits. Of that? Whistling dummy Straits. Them. They dummied them. I'm pretty sure after years of the Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, Steve Stricker, with that era getting dummied, I'm pretty sure they want to keep that team together for a couple more times so they can put some beatdowns on Europe because yes. they got it handed to them so many times. Yeah, absolutely. And Europe's going to need some help, right? Uh, the same thing. Oh, with that the Europe team's cup. going to be terrible for a long time. They've got <laughs> nobody coming up the pipe. It, it, it doesn't feel like it. Like Adrian Moronk could be a big part of their future. That guy bombs it and he takes 25 seconds to hit. Um, I can't believe I just used that name on the show. I think that's a first. Adrian Moronk. He might yes. even wear squares. Well, I think of a guy like <laughs> DJ. That DJ, I think he he didn't lose a five match in the Ryder. Yeah, 5-0. and oh. All he does is Imagine dominate. him not being there. He's yeah, unreal well, in the Ryder Cup. It's going to happen. It's going to And the same thing again with the President's Cup as well, where you got a lot of really good South American players that are at Live Golf. Like, they need – you need that, right? President's Cup is coming to Canada in 2024. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if you ask Trevor Immelman, he was like, we kind of made it a bit of a fight in the Saturday. Maybe if we had some more quality guys here, yeah. we would – like Cam Smith. How about Smith? Cam Smith? Exactly. Yeah. You know, Mark might want to have Cam Smith. Leishman, you might want to have those guys. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, all right, Noodles, you're playing the role of Canadian hockey teams. Yeah. Uh, I saw a tweet earlier today that since 93 – there have been as many Canadian teams make the cup final as now teams from the state of Florida because Tampa has been there five times and Florida has now been there too. There have been seven Canadian teams in the cup final in 30 years. That is a wild statistic. Yeah. Wild and, and wildly embarrassing. Let's call it what it is. Wildly embarrassing for the country. But what is your level of concern that the state of Florida will win more cups in the next five years than all of the Canadian teams combined? In the next five years? Yes, I uh, guess you have to include this year, too, with Florida already punching a ticket to the cup final. Right, and what if Florida wins this year? Exactly. Like that's, uh, <laughs> I got to say, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was going to say Marty Wildwood, but I might say play it. You can never, never ask me to stop drinking. Because Tampa, I, I'm sorry, like Tampa's not going away. No, that, they're not. That core is not 38 years old. You know, they're not Pittsburgh's core. Like Vasilevsky's 29, and they come in 30. Like they're they're, they're going to have got, to find a way to insert some youth and life into it, though. Noodles, like they got to get some more players. Well, that that's right. But I mean, that's what they'll they'll be able to shuffle. Like that manager, that that whole group. Like as far as the the front office, they're sharp people. Like I, I don't think the the spine of the team is under contract, and they're still top tier players. So Tampa could be right back there, and you know I don't know what Florida does. They might win the cup this year. I, I don't think they're well know, they're exactly. Re- and they put that in the bank. You know why is a Canadian team all of a sudden going to snap out of it in the next five years? Yeah, I'd love so, to see it. Yeah, it but, should have been Marty Wildwood, but I gave it the. In no, the I cage. think that's reasonable. I, yeah. I, I do. I think it's reasonable. I mean, it, it sucks that it's a reality, 
that the Canadian teams, and there's so many different theories on why it hasn't happened, but I think at the forefront of it is, outside I'd say that Vancouver team in 2010, Canada's never had like the best, clear-cut best team in the league. They've had great, great teams, very good teams. Yeah. But outside of the Vancouver team, you can't look at the Leafs at any point, Edmonton at any point, Montreal, and say, no doubt, they're the best. I, like, they are the best, and they're going to take runs at it for years. I, I'll say this. I, I'm going to make try and make a case tomorrow for that 4 team in Calgary against Tampa, where, you know, the, the disallowed goal in game six, the Marty Jelena, mm-hmm. you know, that team was, was a lot deeper than people think. And you had a Ginla and Kiprasov. They had a really hard team to play against, really good quality defensemen. So like, what, I, I, give us a tease. What is the case, though, that they were actually elite, like it wasn't an underdog story? I don't say or, it was an underdog. I, like Tampa, like the Calgary could have won the cup that year, and they yeah. actually might have won the cup if there was a – you know, potential not called back goal, like, a, you know, the parallax angle or whatever it yeah, was yeah, explained. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. It's just interesting. I thought All that right. 04 team was really deep and really sharp. Yeah. Right? They, uh, but listen, Tampa they deserved there. it. Like, listen, Tampa won the cup. I'm not taking it away from them. I'm just saying that 04 team was pretty damn good, too. Yeah. Yeah, they so, were. They were, uh, for sure. Um, all right, I'm playing the role of the next head coach of the Toronto Raptors. What is my level of concern that I'll be held to the standards of Nick Nurse and it will be a challenge to meet them? I- I'm actually low on this. Yes, the shadow of Nurse is going to be hanging around for sure. He-, he won a championship. He had a great run. People love him. You know, it's it's very difficult to follow a guy like that. Very difficult. But I, I- you're not taking over the same team Nick did when he took over. That's that's why I'll say I'm like a six pack and a shot or two. It's yes, that is the direct connection. Same thing with Trey Living. It'll be well, Dubas would have done this. Like that's going to go on for years, right? right? And the next coach in Toronto with the Raptors would be well, Nurse didn't do that. Nurse wouldn't do this. Right? Different right. people, different approaches. But Nick Nurse was very very lucky to get the job when he got the job. He got it before they acquired Kawhi Leonard. Like that's you look back on that man. He was hired, <laughs> and then they got Kawhi. So you know, I, I think people are going to be reasonable with what to expect with whoever the next head coach is going to be. Um, so there you go, role yeah. play level of concern. Fair All right, one thing, nurse, up. one thing Nurse Hayes demanded was, and I think a lot of people appreciated that was just you're going out there and you're going to work your ass off, and that's the bottom line. Attention to def- uh, detail, defense, like he. He wasn't just like fancy stuff and trick plays. He was he was a lot about work, man. Yeah, that's what he hammered home, and and he played his top guys a ton. Oh, right? yeah. Like well, Joel Embiid. That's a whole different story. Yeah. Well, there's reports out there that Fred Van Vliet is now linked to Philly. Right. If if Harden's going to leave, Ooh. maybe Fred follows Nurse down there. Like Fred and him were always on the same. He always was speaking kind of on behalf of Nurse. But, right. Like the two of them were, I think, were very close. Clearly. Let me ask you though, where where is Harden gonna go? Where is Harden gonna be? Back to Houston is the rumor. Yeah, what, like I, I heard I, that. I, didn't oh, he I've wear the fat too. suit to get out of there? Too. Like, wasn't that where was the you it's know a three like three ring circus? Yes, it was Houston. Remember, he showed up yeah. and he was a mess, and then all of a sudden he gets to Brooklyn and he loses like forty pounds overnight. Yeah, or it looked that way. Anyway, it looked. It's just again, it was just a look. Yeah, but it just honestly, like, why would you go to want to go back there? Maybe grass isn't greener on the other side, type I, of thing. Like, what's yeah? I don't what's know, his man. Thought process. I don't know. Like, he he's obviously been around the block now. He's been all over the league. He likes yeah. some. He likes some stuff in Houston. There are reports that he's <laughs> fond of establishments in Houston. There are places no, in no. Houston that he likes. Yeah, loves loves is probably a more appropriate way of putting it. Uh, all right, Pierre LeBron coming up, and uh, Steve Phillips on the Jays back in action tonight. What he's seen out of Pearson, what he met out, out of Kikuchi last night, when will Vladdy hit a home run at the Dome, and Alec Mano on the mound tonight. We still got our picks uh, courtesy of TaylorMade for the Memorial this week. Great field down there. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on TSN 2. All right, we got a uh, pair of tickets to give away to the RBC Canadian Open. A classic yes. emerges at Oakdale Golf and Country Club as it gets set to host the RBC Canadian Open June 6th through 11th right here in the heart of Toronto. Uh, here's your chance to win a pair of tickets. All right, why don't we go with Caller 5? Caller 5 right now at 416-870-1050. 416-870-1050. Caller 5 
is uh, going to catch any round you want to go catch, right, this weekend. It's going to be beautiful down there at Oakdale. And you can catch the best golfers in the world as they battle it out at Canada's lone PGA Tour stop. Also back this year is the RBC Music Concert Series featuring Grammy Award winners Black Eyed Peas and Alanis Morissette. First up in Overdrive will be broadcasting live on site all week. And uh, the course is going to be in great shape. It is in great shape. It's an awesome place. And Rory's coming up. There'll be a lot of great Canadians. Justin Rose is coming up. Sam Burns, my boy Sahit Tagala. Oh, Megan yeah. Party. You had a great recovery on the rink hole. Yes. I, you're Maybe right. 14? 14? <laughs> chunk out of the sand. And... <laughs> he hit a shot. It was unfortunate. Caught a lip, bounced back in the bunker, and then he duffed one, and then he absolutely stoned one dead from the bunker like a yeah. tour player. Yeah, it wow. felt good. Yeah, it walked away with a bogey. <clears throat> the way we were playing yesterday, that felt like basically a net hole in one. Dude, effect. you have no <laughs> idea. I felt like I was dipped in holy water today. I, could, I had to do it. I had to get back out there and do something that looked like golf. I right. had to do it. I know. I'm nervous. I, I haven't. Dude, played. I, I mean, was too. I was like, what if I do that again, what I right. did yesterday? Yeah. That's it. Exactly. So your swing gets out of whack or, oh. you know, you're out of sync because you're you're doing different things because you're just playing a totally different style of course and, you know, from different tees and everything was different. Like that's Oakdale was set up to, to punish us yesterday dude yeah. we got to wow. just say what tour players say beautiful facility didn't fit my eye didn't fit my eye that's right and it will wow. fit somebody's eye someone's gonna make a lot of money next week dude when someone's gonna have to golf their hayes? ball man yeah for sure when, when are you playing at hayes aren't you playing pro am uh, a week today yeah Woo. a week today and and it, it sounds i i know <laughs> i'm playing with a couple of people one you know two in particular that i think these two are going to be involved in, in our four-pack. It's going to be interesting. Uh, I'll tell you more about that next week. Once it's confirmed, and obviously I wow. have no power over that, whoever is playing is playing. And if I show up and I get the go-ahead, it's go time. We'll lock it in. So I'm getting nervous about that, though. Like my rep at the Pro-Am, right, is so intact. And <laughs> there's it's, a buzz. Yeah, it's so a buzz. elite. Are you going back out there with your boy, Nikki Taylor? No, we don't know the pro. I'm talking about who else is going to be in our group, right? So, right. um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And hopefully I can have more info on that next week. You guys want to fire up the, the picks for the Memorial? This is a great field, too. Great track. Yes. Right? It's, it's, it's a big one. The Overdrive PGA Picks are brought to you by 20 Weeks of TaylorMade, the Golf Talk Canada Fantasy Golf Pool. All right, neither of us were even close last week. Like, Emiliano Grillo was not on the short list of who we were looking at. but This is elevated, correct? Yes. It's – Huge field, huge money. You know, all the big boys are there. It is, it is go time. All well, right? it's a coin flip to get one or two. A coin flip to get one or two guys. Yeah. Which one do you want? I'll take Rom because of what we talked about earlier this hour and what he's done at this course, and then he got pulled out because of COVID. I, I think he's looking to get back in the form. I'll take John Rom. I'm taking Scotty Scheffler. Yeah, that's the play all day. Although um, the guy's putting, he claims he's working on it nonstop, and it, mm. it's not happening. He's a T20 machine, though. He has not missed T20 since something like, you know, like the fall of 21 or something like That's that. That's just money every week. Every, every time. week this guy shows up, and he's in contention, and if he wins, he wins. If he doesn't, he walks away with a, a massive amount of money. Wow. Like every So when you take Scheffler, you know he's in contention, even if mm -hmm. the putting's not there. Um, I, I will take Cantlay because of what he's also done on this course, right? Horses for courses or the other way around. I'll he does take play well there. Yeah, I'm he loves take, that I, course. I, I got to think Rory is going to snap out of it sooner or later. This is usually the time of year where he mm -hmm. kicks it into, the, uh, into gear. Rory, and on top of that, I'm going to take a guy that I think has been invisible this year, Justin Thomas. Yeah, JT has not played well. Like, he just hasn't been in the running at any Dude, point. Dude, not even sniffing. No, and, and wow. I'll take a guy that's kind of in a similar spot who who I've been waiting to get cooking, and he's coming up here next week, and if he comes Morikawa. up victorious, no, I'm going to go Sammy Burns. Sam Burns, Team RBC. He'll be up here next week. It's my boy. I might get paired with Sam next week. Who knows? I'm going to go Spieth 
and Fegala as my last two picks. Okay, so how many more picks do I have? <laughs> I have five. I only have five players. You have five? Okay. I, do I have two more noodles? I don't yes. know. I don't think anyone's paying attention anyway. I do. I've been trying to write them down, but it's okay. moving quick. So. I'm going to go. I, I'm waiting for this. At some point, this guy's going to win. I say it almost every week or every Sung Jay? Week. No. Cameron Young. Cameron ah, Young. Cameron Young. It's a bomber's golf course. I expect him to bomb the ball, and I think he's in contention. And then on top of that, <laughs> every, Take Sung Jay. You got you to get back on the horse. I can't. You got to get back on the horse. I can't, and I won't. Um, Shoffley. Give me Xander. Give me yeah. Xander Shoffley. We you know? over, over pick. It's an over pick for both of us. Yeah. He just, he's in contention a lot. Like it's, he's like the Leafs. They, he punches a ticket, and then it it's doesn't there. work, and they come up with, a, oh, Bob, stop this this time. Oh, is this, you know, there's always a yeah. reason. Gary Price, there's always right, something, exactly. right? exactly. Make PJ Picks weekly for your chance to win the 20 weeks of TaylorMade Fantasy Golf Pool, over $40,000 in TaylorMade product, plus a trip to Casa de Campo Golf Resort. Enter now at golftalkcanada.com. Steve Phillips, Pierre Lebrun coming up, final hour. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.